Welcome to the Designing Music Now podcast, a podcast dedicated to the craft of creating music for video games and interactive media. I'm your host, Dale Crowley. Today, I will be speaking with composer and audio director, Steve Horowitz. Now let's listen to a collection of Steve's eclectic works. From the film, Super Size Me. Excerpt from Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. Excerpt from Invasion from the Chicken Planet with Morgan Spurlock narrating. Needles in a Heavenly Haystack. There are more stars in the heavens than there are humans on Earth. Excerpt from SpongeBob Movie, The Game. Woohoo! My time machine, perfect! Excerpt from Hollow by The Code International. Excerpt from Like Powder to the Light on the album Stations of the Breath. Excerpt from Song of the Night Air with Michael Evans on the album Unnatural Acts. Excerpt from Pa Qua String Quartet Number no. 2. Excerpt from Berkeley High Concert Orchestra. Yes, the picture is great. I love the background that you've got going there. What do I have? Oh, Mighty Mouse. You see Mighty Mouse back there. Yeah, and the cartoons and all the games you've worked on. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Very nice. (laughs) That's not even all of them. That's just some of them. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Um, All right, well, let's uh, go ahead and get started here. Um, First of all, thank you again very much for taking the time today. Thank you. uh, To be here, and also uh, please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, My name is Steve Horowitz, and I am a composer. (laughs) Simple and sweet. How did you get started in music? How did I get started in music? Actually, I started when I was six years old, so I've done music my entire life. There's nothing else I've ever really done, (laughs) sadly. Um, I started playing guitar when I was six, and uh, my sister had guitar lessons at this local place near our house. We mm-hmm. lived in, I lived in Miami, and um, she didn't want the lessons anymore, so I started taking them, and mm-hmm. I never stopped. I played guitar all the way through um, junior high school, and then when my family moved out here to California to Berkeley, um, I'm in San Francisco now, but we moved to Berkeley. I went to Berkeley High. Um, I switched to bass. They had an award-winning jazz program, and uh, it was run by this this fellow named Phil Hardiman. Uh, he's no longer with us, but he was amazing uh, jazz educator. Um, and so I went from playing rock to playing more jazz, and I picked up bass, and I found my instrument. I found out I was a bass player. Who knew? <laughs> so I played upright. They gave me an upright, and then they gave me an electric. It was awesome. Fantastic. Wow. And so what are your earliest memories of music? Wow. Earliest memories. Well, actually, the, the earliest memory I have of music actually is listening to a recording of Harry Belafonte singing uh, The Fox. Do you know that song? Uh, so, hum Fox. a few bars. Night. Pray to the moon to give him light. It was many a mile to go that night. I have this really early, early memory of sitting there with um, my mom had a a turntable in the living room and playing it and then her and then going again 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 so i must have been like five years old interesting listening to that yeah, yeah the days of the turntable i remember that 
they're back. Yeah, they certainly are. They're with back. A vengeance. <laughs> and so talk a little bit about your educational background. Uh, I was totally self-taught. So I went, um, you know, I played guitar, played rock guitar and, and folk stuff. And then I started playing jazz in, in high school at Berkeley High, like we were talking about. Um, and I was really pretty much self-taught. Um, although, you know, I, you know, in school, you know, high school, that's, that's, that's teaching. But in terms of formal study, um, I didn't go to music school until I was 24 years old. Hmm. Um, and I, you know, I, I was writing all this music, uh, post high school, I was gigging, um, making my living playing music and writing music and also engineering. You know, I had a recording studio that I worked at with, uh, some friends. Um, and I used to record bands and all kinds of groups, but, um, you know, um, I just got to a point, I just reached a wall, you know, in my personal development where I knew it was time to go to, go to music school. I, I, I was writing, but I, there were things that are mm -hmm. confusing me and I gotten as I felt I had gone as far as I could. Um, and then I uh, went down and I studied at Cal arts. So right. I studied with, uh, Stephen Lucky Mosco and, uh, Mike Fink and Morton Sabotnik and Mel Powell. So that was absolutely amazing. Um, so I studied composition at Cal Arts and oops, God. what were we talking about? Cal Arts. So <laughs> Cal, Arts. Um, Cal Arts was amazing. It really was phenomenal. Um, Cause I got there and I'd all been already been writing a bunch of music and there were certain questions I had like, well, how could I notate this differently? Or wow. You know, writing for live instruments that I hadn't written for before that, you know, the only instruments I'd written before were, were friends of mine or for my mm -hmm. group, for my band. So, you know, it was total amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, lucky. Well, I studied with Mike Fink the first year that I was there as my primary uh, teacher. And he was, uh, Mike's a fantastic composer. If you don't know his music, you can, Michael John Fink. Um, mm -hmm. He writes some beautiful, gorgeous, wonderful music um, that's really, really worth uh, exploring. And um, he helped me with a bunch of stuff. And then the second year I studied with Lucky primarily, and that was just mind blowing because you know i would go i would show him pieces and within five minutes we'd be talking about exactly the thing that was bothering me or on my mind without me even articulating it to him he could just tell by the written page where mm -hmm. i was at so that was really really cool so cal arts was a fantastic experience i wrote chamber orchestra pieces i had oh. tons of solo pieces played it was phenomenal great marvelous experience highly recommended <laughs> fantastic um, changing gears a little bit, if you could have a conversation with anyone, living or dead, who would that be? Wow. Okay, I'm going with uh, Frank Zappa. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, what would you talk about? Music. <laughs> <laughs> I love Zappa. I'd also, you know, I, you know, I'd love to have actually a conversation with Lucky again. It's been a while, and he passed mm -hmm. away in 2005, so I would love to sit down with him and just talk about music. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So uh, what is your favorite video game? Wow. Uh, let's see. Does uh, Miss Pac-Man count? It does. It's a very, <laughs> very great video game. <laughs> if you said, we'll play a game right now, I would play Miss Pac-Man. Or Joust. I'd play okay. Joust. Zork. Actually, yes. uh, my son, Finn, started playing Zork uh, the other day. Text Adventure. It's awesome. It really is. I yeah. played the heck out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Go Probably. north. Go west. <laughs> yeah. For more modern games, I really like Limbo is a game yeah. that's been around for a while. I really love mm -hmm. playing. And, um, you know, Red Dead Redemption is a nice, uh, nice game with a nice score as well. Let's check out some of Steve's most recent work. Sure and shine. Enchanted carpet ride. Swiper magic carpet up and down. That's it. For this genie training flight, we have to try to collect as many genie coins as possible and find enchanted treasure chests. There are two treasure chests to find on this magic carpet ride, so keep your eyes open. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Portal Power Gameplay Video. Bots. There they go, dudes! Now. 
let them get away. Mutant Ninja Turtles Battle Match. Three, two, one, fight! Um, what's the most memorable experience you've had with music while playing a video game? Well, the most memorable has to be the first, you know, I still remember, um, how to put this, I still remember the first time I saw anybody play Super Mario Brothers because of the music. Yes, of course. It was just burned into your head. You could mm -hmm. not get away from it. Yeah. It's the thing that jumped out of the TV and yeah. out of the 2600 and was like, what? And whether you loved it or you hated it, which I loved it, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's actually a really memorable moment for me in terms of video game music. It wasn't until years and years of doing game music that I realized how, what a big influence that, that was and what a moment actually that was of hearing, hearing uh, you know, Koji Kondo's music. And fantastic. And who's your favorite composer? Video game composer or just composer composer? Composer composer. Oh, that's too hard. You got to give me like the desert island. <laughs> I have like the desert island top five. Yes, you can have the top five. Should we go by genre? You know, let's go by favorite. <laughs> if go, you could only listen to one composer. Oh no, that's on a desert island. Super unfair. Wow. <laughs> okay, so Stravinsky comes to mind. Love okay. Stravinsky. Arnold Schoenberg, uh, yes. huge, huge influence on me. Zanakis, Ligeti, also huge influences. Uh, let's see. On the film scoring side of things, Bernard mm -hmm. Herrmann, Jerry Goldsmith. Wow. Yeah. Right. Um. Let's see. On the game side of things, um, Guy Whitmore. Nice. Good call. Love Guy's scores. He is truly a game composer's game composer. And what he can do in five megabytes of music is just mind blowing. Right. I mean, when people, <laughs> I'm going to give Guy a big compliment in this interview here. So I okay. hope you see it, Guy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, when people ask me what the difference is between a game composer and a film composer, I point at Guy. There you go. And I tell them to go check out his work because he really. And, and I'm not dissing the, all the other people who are working in games. It's just Guy has an uncanny knack and for understanding what game music is about and from coming at it from that perspective. So, yeah, yeah, he's a technical composer as well. So he understands whys and middleware and how to get the most out of it. So yeah, Absolutely. Agree. And he always comes from the perspective of how can we make the music more adaptive and dynamic to the actual gameplay um, itself which always renders very, very interesting results, I think. Excellent. And so now who's your least favorite composer? Oh, God, I'm going <laughs> to diss people. No, yeah. I can't. It's hard. I really, <laughs> truthfully, I like a really, really wide array of music. And there's mm -hmm. almost nothing that I listen to that I'm just like, ugh, you know, um, hate, hate. I mean, you know, it depends on your mood in terms mm -hmm. of the day. But yep. I would be very, I mean, I'd be very hard-pressed to just, pick out a composer and all right so you want to a little bit of something about me so so one of the things is i'm not a huge fan of minimalism okay okay i'm yeah. not and it's always you know it's been a very big part of my life having to say that avoiding it mm -hmm. because so many of my friends are post you know write post minimally and so many you know it's been such a large movement for such a long time but i'm not a huge fan of uh, of of minimalism um, so, you know, as right. a genre, I'm probably not going to be, you know, popping that, that bad LP out and shoving it in the disc player to, uh, to, to make it run. Okay. And so what is your favorite instrument? Wow. Again, that's like picking like God, your favorite children. <laughs> I mean, these man, my favorite instrument. Okay. I do have a favorite instrument for you. you? All right. Contrabass clarinet. Nice, nice. Because... I've done several recordings because the thing just sounds crazy. I mean, the low end is ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? Contra bassoon is close, but really on the low end, I'm a bass player, so I like right. low end. But contra bass clarinet, so I've done several album recordings. You can go check them out. Um, the uh, 
first and second code CDs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know there's another one in there where I've, I've played with Ralph Carney. Now, Ralph Carney also plays contrabass clarinet and uh, awesome. Just awesome. because of the range. It's like a cello in that sense. Well, it's lower. It's a full, full, almost, you know, octave, two octaves below the cello. But it, it also goes higher, right? I mean, it's got a pretty decent range. Oh, it's got or, a huge, tremendously wide. Yes. But its low end is just sick. It's just, it's just, the, it's just crazy. Awesome. So then, what is your least favorite instrument? Oh, again, picking favorites. Least favorite instrument. Mm-hmm. Wow. I guess <laughs> I should have read the questions that you sent over to me. <laughs> least favorite instrument. Just off the top of your head, what's one that you cringe when you hear? Well, any instrument that's played badly, you know, <laughs> out of tune violins. Or, <laughs> I love them. <laughs> um, really hard. Least I really I don't I don't think I have one. Kazoo. Kazoo. <laughs> Okay. I mean, if I had to choose, it would be low on the list because it would right. be down there. It would, certainly wouldn't be uh, up there. All right. So with Kazoo it is. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? That's uh, writing. Poetry. I would be a poet. Wow. A beat nice. poet. I'd have at least 10 volumes of beat poetry by now. <laughs> oh, no. Wait, forget the beat poetry thing. Although that's true stand-up comedy wow yeah i would love to be a stand-up comedian and and i've 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 semi attempted it at times but never fully because i'm too scared i'm too chicken because it's too hard it's really hard yeah yeah i'm a huge fan and admirer of of stand-up comics in fact i was going to show you uh this book that uh, we've just gotten us that you might appreciate too judd apatow just came out with a book a list of it's an interview book that he's interviewed literally everybody, Seinfeld, uh, Louis C.K., Chris Rock, nice. Linda Dunham, so on. So highly recommend that mm. uh, as a, a person that is also interested in, in stand-up. And, uh, just, and it's also related to music. It's a very uh, you know, rhythmic sort of skill. Yeah, but it's, more, it's, more, it's like being a soloist. You know? It's more terrifying. You know? Mm. You know, you're just out sure. there. That's, it's just you and nothing else. That's why I'm a bass player. I stand in the back. Right. Yep. You know, I kind of like, you know, control things from behind, you know, from behind the scenes. But being just out there, you audience, that's that's scary. Yeah, it is. It is. I've never tried it. <laughs> Don't think I'd have the, the nerve. Yeah. Um. So what was your first major break? In In games or just in general? Let's go in games. What what? was your trend yeah how did you first get into games yeah so um uh, there's a good story behind that so mm-hmm. um i was living out here in san francisco this is in the i had just come back up from cal arts actually so it was the early 90s probably 1991 mm-hmm. and my cousin uh came to town mm-hmm. and his girlfriend at the time um her her best friend was uh married to uh, a guy named mark miller who um, Mark got the first uh, Lifetime Achievement Award at the Gang Gang yeah, Awards. I saw that. Yeah. But uh, Mark um, had a company that doing music and sound for games. Hmm. So so my cousin Mitch, who's from Long Island, was like, Stevie, Stevie, you gotta meet my gotta meet my friend Mark. <laughs> I was like, okay, fine. And I had just come up from Cal Arts, and we went and we were at the Cafe du Nord, which is mm-hmm. I don't know if it's still there. I think the du Nord just closed down mm-hmm. on Market Street. And uh, the, a band was playing, and Mark was screaming at me. He's like, did you ever think about making your living writing music for games? I was like, <laughs> no! <laughs> I thought, I went to CalArts. I was supposed to, you know, make crazy weird noises and die poor. That's what they told me I was supposed to do Right. when I left CalArts. Um, but I did start working for Mark, and that was a tremendous education. Um, he gave me my start in doing interactive media and doing games, and he was working for everybody at the time. So Sega, Sony, Crystal Dynamics, mm. and big companies, small companies, and, and that was amazing because, you know, you'd be working on a console game for, for Rocket Science games, mm-hmm. you know, one day, 
going over there. That was the start of, of Sillywood, right? The mm -hmm. merger of Silicon Valley and Hollywood. So I'd go over to the office and they'd have catered lunches every day, you know, <laughs> and just amazing, you know, right? They were, they were going to make two games, then eight games, then six, and then they made two really crappy games. And, <laughs> and that was the end of them. But, you know, on the other hand, we were dealing also with companies that were like one, or I remember one two-person company and their whole thing, they were going to, Dante's Inferno on CD-ROM. Mm -hmm. The whole yeah. thing. So hours and hours and hours of recording, um, you know, actors reading through, you know, the book and the whole thing. I mean, yeah. I don't think they ever finished it. I mean, <laughs> monumental task, right? So yeah. um, that was awesome. And San Francisco now and just like then is total hotbed of, of uh awesome game development so that's that's how i got my start wonderful and so in those early days what is a particular game that you worked on that you think was the defining moment of those early days <laughs> uh well the cadillacs and dinosaurs is the one that, that people remember the most mm -hmm. uh because that actually got quite a bit of got a, quite a bit of press and quite a bit of play but for me my favorite project of that period was a game that was never released and it was called roach racer and the idea was, that, you know, there were going to be these roaches. Basically, it was like a car racing game, except imagine no cars, roaches on a track. And first they're in the bathroom, then they're in the kitchen, mm -hmm. you know. And um, we recorded down, these were down, this was down at the Sega Studios, uh, down the peninsula um, in Palo Alto. And we recorded, I think, two tracks that were just, it was, it was great. Mark was just like, just do what, do what you want to do. And we went in, we recorded live band, and overdubs, like the whole thing, and these tracks. And I remember sitting at the session where we played it for the producer, the game designer producer who, who had to give the green light. And he came in, and he sat. He's like, okay, play it for me, boys. <laughs> Put this newspaper up <laughs> and pretended to read. So Mark hit the track, or maybe he was reading, I don't know. Mark hit it, played it through. Um, and, uh, and at the end, he listened to both tracks, put his paper down and he was like, well, that was either the best thing I ever heard or the worst thing I've ever heard. I just don't know. And he left. <laughs> oh, Mark, that's, that, that's high that, praise. Yeah. That was one of my most memorable game sessions, you know, and, and impressionable at that time, you know, so I looked at Mark, I'm like, did I, did I screw up? <laughs> All right. He's like, oh, it'll be fine. And the game never came out anyway, so. Hmm. So between then and Nickelodeon, which is uh, where you're uh, yeah. at now, what, what, uh, what was the path? Uh, so I was here in the Bay Area in 96, and my wife and I, uh, Keisha, we moved to Europe for four years. So we decided uh, to move to the Netherlands. So we were in Holland for four years. Mm -hmm. um, I toured over there. I recorded over there, had pieces played, um, played with my group, and also taught a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we decided to move back, we moved back to New York City. Oh, okay. So we didn't move back to uh, to the Bay Area. We moved back uh, 2000, Y2K. Mm -hmm. Right. Our plane did not fall out of the sky. Scary time for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you remember that? That was. Oh, I do. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and, and being a programmer, I definitely had a lot of trepidation about the databases crashing worldwide and everything else. But yeah, we survived. Well, the cool thing, it was a lot of good work for programmers, you know. Mm -hmm. Since then, it's been downhill. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The, um, so I got to New York and um, got a chance to go for an interview at MTV Networks mm -hmm. um, through a friend of a friend. And I was like, you know, I've been a freelance composer, musician my whole life. Never had a full-time job. I was like, this is silly. And I went in for the interview. And it was a it was a fantastic interview. I ended up interviewing. Um, this was at the time the interview was with Nick Online, which is now Nick Digital, which right. at that at that point was you know Nick.com and, and Nick Junior dot com. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I I did the interview, and it was with a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Chris Romero, um, who oh, was yeah. the VP of Technical Productions at, at Nick. And um, it, you know the interview was awesome because mm -hmm. I, I went in. And he was actually, it was funny, he had done his, his homework, you know, 
he was grilling me on a bunch of like technical terms, like what's the Nyquist frequency and what's this? And I had just come <laughs> back from Europe. I was teaching that stuff. I could read it off the oh, back wow. of my eyelids. You know, I was like, oh, yeah. blah, blah, blah. he was like, okay. Um, and, and then it also turned out that we had a bunch of uh, friends in common. He had lived in San Francisco for a very long time and gone to high school out here. And we knew a bunch of the same people. We were the same age. It was, so it turned out great because it, uh, I got hired. I got the gig, which was actually really wonderful times at the height of the dot-com boom, which was really a great, very special time, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he, um, um, he, I was, he was my boss during the day. And uh, he was, uh, and I was his boss at night because he started playing in my band, he played percussion, and also played a gamelan. So it was a, it was nice, you know. Wow, yeah. very cool. And you did you guys gig in New York? Yeah, we gigged around all over the place. And in fact, we're going to be gigging in New York recent uh, again. Um, uh, just around the AES show on Thursday, the twenty seventh, we're going to have a gig at uh, at Spectrum New Music. Wonderful in New York. And actually, this is the New York band. Uh, we recorded an album called Elevator Culture, which was the Code International. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to do uh, a lot of that album. Um, nice. In October. We haven't played that music together probably in seven, eight, nine years. Now, is the music written so you'll be able to pass out sheet music, or is it uh, you have to listen to it and pick uh, it up by ear? How how will that work? A little, work? Bit, of both. little yeah. bit of both. They're charts, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, and, and tunes from the album, you know. Yeah. Great. And so uh, I guess from there, you came back out here eventually. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I was uh, in-house in, 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 at Nick Digital for 10 years mm -hmm. um, and then uh, moved back to, to uh, the Bay Area in 2010. Let, let me stop you, because somewhere in there, you composed the music for Morgan Spurlock. Yes, yes. So uh, while I was in New York and doing the Nickelodeon thing, I also, um, another cousin story, my cousin Dave, I guess everything that's ever happened in my, <laughs> in my family, anything good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, my cousin Dave uh, worked with Morgan because uh, my cousin Dave did uh, event planning for Sony. So mm -hmm. he used to do all the events for the Sony truck. They bring the Sony truck around to beach volleyball tournaments and had a bunch of PlayStations on it. And Morgan was the barker. Morgan had the gig to like lather up the crowd and get them to come and, and check out all the place, you know, what was going on on the truck. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew Morgan a little bit, but then, you know, when I got to New York, Dave's like, hey, you should go, you know, see Morgan. So I met Morgan, uh, and you know he was at that time running around New York with a with a, a business plan in his back pocket for a show called "I Bet You Will," mm -hmm. which started out online and actually was one of the first shows to go from online to be sold to broadcast, and I sold it to MTV. Um, and you worked on that, right? I worked on that. Yeah. Um, we did like forty episodes of that show, right? Um, actually, online, and then we did like another sixty episodes for MTV. Wow. And then Morgan, after that, got the idea for doing Super Size Me and pulled me into doing that. And I'm very glad he did. So I did the score for Super Size Me. Um, I also did a couple other TV shows with him. And, and there were a bunch of small films. And, you know, New York's a pretty active media town. So lots of yeah. cool projects. Um, yeah, yeah, outside of games as well. That's still to this day one of my favorite music uh, t scores for film. It's so memorable, the, uh, the tunes that you came up there. Oh. Just Really, really incredible. Really helped that documentary uh, to succeed, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it was a great documentary, too. Yeah. Great. And so then from then you did move back out here eventually. Yeah. 2010, uh, we decided that we had enough mm -hmm. of uh, the weather. So we moved uh, <laughs> back to uh, back to uh, the Bay Area, San Francisco. Excellent. Um, OK, so what is your uh, music composition process? So you've got a let's say for games. Or yeah. choose choose any process. What what do you, what do you typically go through? Do you compose in the box in the DAW? Do you compose live? Uh, write it down on paper. What, what's your what's your process? Oh, I go through hell. No, <laughs> ripping things out of my head. It's just torturous. No, um, it just depends. Uh, so you know, I also have a large body of work for like my own compositions, whether it's string quartets and chamber mm -hmm. music, and also my band stuff. You know, you can you can provide links for that stuff so people can hear some of that. Yep. Um, so that's really different for me. So when I have the time and when I'm writing, you know, a lot of times I'm still using a uh, pencil and paper, hmm. you know, and, uh, you know, writing things down and putting it into the computer using programs like Finale, you know, to get the scores together and, 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 and all of that. Um, when I'm working on game projects, um, unless I'm working on, you know, uh, specific types of 
uh, instrumental projects, for the most part, it's in the box. For the mm -hmm. most part, I'm working in Pro Tools. You know, Pro Tools is I use it for everything. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and uh, yeah, MIDI keyboards and virtual instruments and sample playback and and put it all together and do the mixes and yeah, deliver. And do you have any tips or tricks for writing adaptive scores? Or do you just write it as a linear score and then go from there by, you know, printing branches and stuff? Sure. <laughs> ah, therein lies the rub. Yeah. Um, always when you're working on games, you always have to think about the gameplay mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. So I can never divorce myself from that. So that's, you've hit on another thing, which is another huge difference. You know, when I'm writing music for myself or, you know, I'm not thinking about anything but but music in a pure sense. When I'm writing for games, I have to think about music in a pure sense, and I also have to think about how it's going to function with the game, always right. from the beginning. So, you know, what the gameplay mechanic is, how it's going to be triggered, how long the pieces of music can be, how much music I need, what mm -hmm. sort of music I need. Um, can I do an adaptive score? You know, is it on a platform where I can do that, right? Are they using Unity or what game engine are they using? You know, so all these millions of questions that you have to go through um, and then you figure out what's what's possible, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, it's all it's all a process of peeling away the onion. It's all a process of framing the project so that you know what it's made of. And once you know what it's made of, then you can pick your instruments, you know, and you can go. I was thinking about that today. I'm working on a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle game right now. Oh. And I have to go back. We've worked on, you know, three of the worlds. And now it's like, oh, we're going to update two more. And I'm like, well, I go back to it. And so much of the work has been done because the roadmap is sitting in front of me. Mm -hmm. The instrumentation, you're solving problems. And, you know, just like any time you're writing and composing and you're figuring out the best way to, to develop those ideas and, 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 and to put them together, right? Right. It really depends on what the game needs and how, you know, the music will interact with the gameplay and everything else. So absolutely. You know, maybe it's a game where as much as as much as I would love to, I want to oh, if we only had a 60 piece orchestra. But, you know, it it needs a it needs an eight bit score, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> so it's like you got to you got to you got to always go, you know, and that's true whether you're composing um, for yourself or you're composing it, it, anytime you're writing music, there's always there's always that that need that we feel as humans to to put our mark on it, mm -hmm. right? And every idea we come up is with is great, but you know, when we step back, we realize that. Um, and I, this is what when I studied with Lucky uh, Stephen Lucky Moscow, um, this is what he used to talk about. He used to talk about the morality of a piece of music, and I, you know, I was a young man then, and I was like, morality, I don't. I don't have any morality. What are you talking about, right? <laughs> but I, I came over the years to understand that in, in, in all cases, once you put paper to pencil to paper, or once you start to input MIDI notes on your keyboard, or once you start, um, and a lot of times, you know, that's, that's a hard thing to do, but it's, you know, it's, it's what you're trying to, to, to achieve. Well, and I think that's particularly true when you're working with a group of people in a collaborative way on a game because they'll have a vision of what the music should be. And the world itself demands certain styles of music that, you know, work Absolutely. within that world. So, yeah. And that's, and that's the part where it gets very different from when you're the boss, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you may have a very strong idea for this is what this really should be and what it needs to be, and you push it as far as you can. And if, if other people are like, no. It's not going to happen. Then you have to you have to be able to let go. Right. Great. And when do you find yourself most creative? When do I find myself most creative? That's a very good question. That's a very creative question. Um, actually, strangely enough, uh, I find myself most creative in the mornings these days, which used to be completely opposite. For most mm -hmm. of my life, I was a total like three in the morning, four in the morning, mm -hmm. night owl. And uh, I guess Peter Pan grew up. And now it's usually between the hours of like eight in the morning, <laughs> noon, mm -hmm. that um, a lot of things seem to happen. Well, I'm going to kick myself for asking this question, but when are you most happy? No, no, no. That's a good question. That's, okay. that's, that's a fair question. Uh, when am I most happy is not really a time. I won't give you a time. Like, I'm always happy at 4.30. Yeah. That's, that's no. you know, that's happy hour or something like that. <laughs> uh, I'm most happy when when just uh, things are going well. Creative projects I'm working on, family life is good, people are happy, everybody's healthy. 
Mm -hmm. I'm happy. I'm a simple man. You know, health, you know, music, happiness. That's, that's, uh, that's all I can ask for. Fantastic. And are there any particular activities you do to get the creative juices flowing? Another good question. Creative juices flowing. Sleep is good. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I've chronically underslept or have lack of sleep, so more sleep always, you know, seems to help me be in a better mood. Um, you know, a little bit of exercise, walking, getting outside, you know, getting out of the studio. Right. That's a nice thing. Nice way to get, get things moving. If things are ever really, no, truthfully, if I'm ever, you know, in a situation where ideas aren't flowing quick enough or things aren't happening, you know, I'll just get outside, take a walk, you know. I live in San Francisco. I don't have to worry about ass weather in New York, you know. I don't have to worry that it's <laughs> snowing or it's 105 degrees, although it is warm today. Yes. Um, I do, uh, you know, getting myself out and, uh, you know, being in San Francisco, which is one of the most beautiful freaking cities on earth. Um, I'm just so happy to be here. And um, that that often is great inspiration to me. I live I live right by um, Glen Park Canyon. Hmm. So just taking a walk and overlooking the canyon uh, and seeing that is uh, is good inspiration. Beautiful. Well, how important is it to understand audio middleware like FMOD Wise and Elias? I think very important. I mean, uh, if you're if if you're serious about games, then you're serious about understanding why they're different than linear media like film and TV. Mm -hmm. Then you're you're definitely needing to be interested in what middleware is, you know, um, and and why it's important and how they work um, and how composers and sound designers work with them and how they can help and sometimes hinder the uh, the process of uh, of a uh, making great uh, music and sound for games. Excellent. And of course, uh, I learned uh, some of my first uh, stuff about FMOD from you. So uh, really? I appreciate that. Yeah, well, and of course, I, I took with you uh, yeah. down there at uh, in LA and also uh, from your book, which is The Essential Guide to Game Audio, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it's interesting because I, I had a class last night and, and the middleware thing came up again. And, mm -hmm. and, and it is important. It's, it's especially important for uh, people who are getting into the game industry now mm -hmm. yeah. um, and just starting out um, more than when I started out. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, because um, middleware was just developing at that point. It really hadn't even, you know, it was mm -hmm. all in house at that point. It was, so um, it's important now because, you know, these programs are out there and they're being widely used by different companies and for different games. And there's, you know, you have in-house solutions, you have third-party solutions, great stuff like uh, uh, Elias, and you've got, you know, FMOD, and you've got Wise, and you've got Fabric, and Master Audio. So there's more choices than ever. Um, and um, those are essential skills now as you're coming into, into the marketplace. So you know, the more that you can uh, understand and capitalize on, on, on using those, understand what they do, and the more hands-on you are, um, the more employable you are, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, great advice. And uh, final question uh, regarding your new album. Actual, an actual CD with a cover. Yeah, hold it Look. still for a second. Nice. It's called The Ribbon of Extremes by Steve yes. Horowitz. Fantastic. Yes. And that was recorded in San Francisco? Yes, by the Guerrilla Composers Ensemble, Nick Benavides' group. He is the conductor. Um, and this cover was done by uh, Joe the Artist, Joe uh, Joseph Guglietti, who is the artist who, who I met uh, working on Super Size Me. Is that like Salvador Dali? This is a Yves Tong guy. Okay. So the, the uh, artwork is inspired. It's a homage to the painting called The Ribbon of Extremes by Yves Tong guy. Oh, nice. Um, from 1932, and that's 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 uh, that's where the name of the piece came from. And what style of music is it? Contemporary classical. So mm -hmm. it's uh, off strings and winds, uh, uh, violin, cello, flute, and clarinet, bass clarinet. Right. Um, piano. Hmm. A pretty large percussion setup with a actually a large it's trap set and percussion. Um, yeah, and a conductor. Wonderful. I, I can't wait to hear it. And uh, yeah. congratulations on getting well, that. You, uh, well, you've got a copy coming. Nice. Nice. You can get, it's out online. It, it, just, it was just released, actually. Well, fantastic. Just. Hey, so uh, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, mention or talk about that you're working on or hmm. coming out? 
you know, the only thing that I would I, that we didn't talk about that you can mention is that you know, with our book out and with the the stuff that we're doing with the Game Audio Institute, you know, we've been doing a lot of work in game audio education. Mm-hmm. I think the game audio education market is really developing in interesting ways. So, I mean, other than the workshops we're doing around the country and the speaking at AES and GDC and all the other places, um, the Game Audio Institute is doing quite well. And, you know, schools around the country are starting to buy our levels nice. and buy, um, you know, these uh, what we're calling game lessons mm-hmm. um, now uh, that are, are customized by, you know, Scott does most of the heavy lifting in terms of developing these levels. And, Mm -hmm. and so what we've been able to do is to, is to, is to, I don't want to say, uh, dummy proof, but basically we use game-based learning to teach audio concepts and we're developing more and more of these levels that are, that are in, in games unto themselves, um, that people can use to, uh, create their own music and sound effects and voiceover and edit all of that and put it actually inside a real game um, and, 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 and do that. So we've had some really good success with that and things are, things are going quite well. Right. Plus at the end, the person that is doing these levels and everything, they'll have a demo reel to show from the, from the product. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, that's one of the important things. And that's what, you know, I tell my students um, at the different places that we're teaching is that, you know, um, if you give a you know a video reel to a to an audio director at a game company, that's okay. That's cool. You know that shows that well. You can score cutscenes mm-hmm. and you understand timing. But you know if you're able to actually give them you know a demo piece that's inside an actual game yep. that shows your work, that's very powerful, right? Because it shows that you really understand games and interactive media. Wonderful, Steve. Well, thank you very very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dale. Thank you for listening to the Designing Music Now podcast, a podcast dedicated to the craft of creating music for video games and interactive media. Please visit us at designingmusicnow.com for more info, news, and reviews on this subject. We would love to hear from you.